Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Noor. I am a senior at NYU studying media, culture, and communications and sociology. I'm also a member of the Multi-Faith Advisory Council here with Nick. Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Nick. I am a senior here at NYU's uh, Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Um, I'm also someone who is uh, discerning ordained ministry in the Episcopal Church, um, and I'm happy to be with you all. On this call as well, we have the director and filmmaker of um, the movie that we were about to watch, Bill McCarvey. Do you want to, if you would like yeah. to introduce yourself? If you just want to say hi, Bill. Hi, everyone. Uh, Bill McGarvey. Uh, do you want me to introduce the film right now? And, and That'd be great. Yeah, please do. Good to be with you. And thank you to NYU. Uh, and, and I should say Judson Memorial Church, which is literally right next door to the building you're in. Judson, as you'll figure out if you didn't, if folks didn't already know, was very central, a central place during the Occupy uh, movement in 2011. Uh, and they're, they're kind of co-sponsoring this, although during pandemic, obviously they can't be in the same building. So we appreciate everything you've done. I work for the Fellowship of Reconciliation as a filmmaker, a filmmaker and a media person. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a background on the Fellowship of Reconciliation, it's in, literally today is the 106th anniversary of its founding in November 11th. Uh, the International Fellowship of Reconciliation was founded in order to sort of avert, help avert some of the war in Europe in 1914 and 1915. They came over here and founded uh, uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So it's a 106 year old organization. It is, um, it has had many luminaries who have been members. Dr. Martin Luther King gave his name to two organizations in his lifetime. One was his own, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the other was Fellowship of Reconciliation USA. Also, Jane Adams, who's the, my, my friend, Anthony Nicotero, would kill me if I didn't say this. The founder of the social work profession and Nobel Peace Laureate was among the founding members of 4USA. Uh, across the world, there are 20,000 plus members, no, numerous local chapters, religious peace fellowships and ally organizations. And uh, the work continues today. And, and it's really exciting to me when I was asked uh, over the summer that uh, Ethan Vesley Flad, who's also the co-executive director with Anthony right now of the fellowship, mentioned there was going to be a 10-year anniversary. Uh, we should do something on Occupy. And I said, why don't we do an oral history? Uh, and we were in touch with, uh, I interviewed seven different faith leaders who were involved in Occupy, both in New York City and in Oakland, and put together this 30-minute uh, short documentary on it. And I learned an awful lot doing it. Um, but uh, I'm really glad that some young folks are interested in this and we can have some conversations around this. We, of course, the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA has a little bit of an issue with the website today, but I will send anybody if they want to get in contact, uh, bill at mcg-media.com. Please feel free because the work continues. Uh, and I think after when we have the conversation with Reverend Rosemary and Reverend Michael, you'll get some inspiration, hopefully, and some real ideas about, um, I think you're going to see a lot of relevance to today. Uh, in in what we we're what we what was going on ten years ago, a lot of echoes. So I'll shut up and uh, mm -hmm. thank you, Nick and Nora, for having us and Chelsea. And um, I guess you're going to put the phone on any second now, and, and look forward to seeing you on, on the other end. Enjoy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to do the Chelsea's going to do the <laughs> tech magic, and then we'll get started. I'm Chelsea. I'm coming to do the tech magic. <laughs> My name is uh, Matthew Arlick. Thank you. So my name is Nicola Torbett. Streets. My name is Nathan Schneider. Streets. Our streets. Our streets. My name is Carolyn Clausen. My name is Shonda Ja. 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 
name is Reverend Michael Ellick. Uh, Ten years ago, I was the uh, minister of Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village and a faith-based community organizer, um, largely with the New Sanctuary Movement, but with a few other justice movements in town. Ten years ago, I was the senior minister at the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. At the time that Occupy started, I was just starting my second year of seminary. Uh, at Union Theological Seminary in New York. I live in Oakland, California, which is where I participated in Occupy. Um, I am part of uh, United Church of Christ congregation. Ten years ago, I had just moved to New York City to start grad school at Union Theological Seminary. I was also at the end of my conversion process to uh, conversion to Judaism, and I was a member of Jewish Voice for Peace and had just gotten started in organizing with the chapter that was in New York City. Ten years ago, I was co-pastoring First Christian Church of Oakland with Tyam Ree Stan Wilson. This is I first got involved in Occupy um, as a reporter for Waging Nonviolence. I was um, uh, this was the midst of the 2011 uprisings around the world. And from afar, we'd been covering all that had been going on in the Middle East and spreading across Europe. And uh, one of the things that we were really interested in was what happens before something like this, an uprising hits the streets. <laughs> My first sense of Occupy was that it uh, reflected a deep emotional need of a whole generation of people. And it was very exciting. It was very, um, can't believe they pulled this off. Can't believe everyone's staying. Um, can't believe everyone continues to watch. Um, so I was really intrigued by it. And I had, like I said, I had a lot of friends who were very passionate advocates for Occupy and for what it was doing. It had some highfalutin, very well educated, but very, I think, in my mind, not experienced anarchist analysis of, of how it was gonna move. What pulled me in as it continued to swell day after day, week after week, um, was this did seem like a younger person phenomenon. It felt like a certain set of activists and a certain demographic. Um, not only did it seem that way on the ground, not exclusively, but that was sort of how it was getting hammered in the media. And you have to remember, I was in the business of trying to radicalize and activate communities of faith around issues, social justice issues in New York. And this felt like they were taking a huge leap forward in the analysis. And so um, I decided to get more involved and instead of just hanging out with my friends down there to kind of organize a faith space around this. To be honest, none of us quite knew what to make of it. It was exciting. It was, we'd never seen anything quite like it. And I also remember that it didn't quite fit any of the organizing frameworks that my friends had. And so that had, we spent a lot of late nights discussing, um, this doesn't quite fit in with what we learned about how to organize communities. Uh, how practical is this? Will it bring about change? Um, what is the meaning of this thing? I uh, didn't know anybody there. Um, they were not particularly interested in people of faith because uh, I had I brought that up um, at that time. That changed over the course of the movement here in Oakland. I think that what sort of initially attracted me to it was that it was this big tent. I mean, both sort of literally, there were lots of big tents there, um, but also, it, you know, it was very, you know, in a way that I had never experienced before in in, in movements was that it was. It really, there was everyone there, everyone was there, you know, from, you know, activists to labor organizers to uh, to, to faith people to um, unhoused folks. Like, what, what seemed to unify everyone was, um, was, was sort of rallying against uh, economic injustice. There were people on exercise bikes making smoothies, channeling their own energy to generate uh, electricity. There was the interfaith tent where there were people of, you know, Unitarian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Protestant, Catholic, 
as opposed to some other actions where there's a there was a economic actions where there was a very strange and strained relationship between religious and non-religious activists where the, where there was usually a sense of uh we should have them it's strategically smart but we're really not in love with them this had much more of an organic oh yeah we see spirituality is connected to this uh work we're engaged in of anti-capitalism i gathered enough information to know that they were meeting down at judson so i believe that that's how i began working with them um there were just a lot of people in a lot of communities that were doing things that I cared about. Um, the issues, particularly around economic inequality, were very live at that moment. I was really excited by the 99% language. The slogan of the 99%. The language of the 99%. And the idea that all of our grievances were connected and that we had common cause and that the we could be quite large, actually, and quite pointed at a system that was only benefiting a few. And really, you know, more accurately, we're really, we're really talking about the 99.9% because we're really talking about such an extreme minority of, of people around whom, you know, most of the nation's wealth is concentrated. And it was the first time that people were talking about the 1% in common language. So we are here to support you. So we are here to support you. From every synagogue and mosque and church. From every synagogue and mosque and church. To remind this country. To remind this country. That there can be no such thing as justice. There can be no such thing as justice. Until there is economic justice. Until there is economic justice. Also, a lot of toxic racism inside Occupy. It's worth mentioning. And that was so prominent early on, so clear, clearly a lack of racial analysis that um, that was another thing we were working to kind of um, heighten the conversation. Well, you know, one of the things that became apparent is um, Occupy's willingness to confront the police um, to taunt the police, to ask that people place themselves um, in front of the police. Uh, and people of color were like, uh, excuse me, this is New York City. And we already don't have a good relationship with cops here. And you're placing our lives in danger. I think that that was one of the first uh, major moments where you could see Occupy people dealing with the idea that, hey, maybe this, this movement doesn't impact everybody in the same way. The problem is they didn't really respond well to that. Many of the particularly white people coming involved in this did not see a connection with police and with, with racial justice and racial injustice. This lesson about how economic injustice in this country is is built on racial injustice and works through racial injustice and and that the violence of the police became an education in that coming in to the bulk of zakati park this is a generational moment of people who have a certain view of themselves that do not have a um, unified philosophy but have a general sense of disregard for the establishment right and a, and a and a um, kind of broad sense of anarchism, you know, that whatever that might mean to them in local context. But the church is the enemy on all those fronts, right? No matter where you're coming from, we know the church is full of bastards, right? Like, and so, yeah, we had a lot of people who really wanted to educate us as to how uh, terrible we were and, and how um, responsible for so much oppression and and i think any of the and, and and they're right they're totally right like you can't uh be a person of faith i think with integrity without acknowledging that the church itself has been the main perpetuator of empire 
forever and with no exceptions. There's literally no, I mean, there, there are individual exceptions, but not as a religious uh, body. So um, I think that um, obviously if, if you're still here and a person of faith working with the church after acknowledging that, now you're at a more subtle level of, of understanding what the role of the spirit is and what the role of the church is. Uh, uh, as an organizer for uh, justice issues. I think that Occupy Faith, we had more clarity, but what we didn't have, I think in the same way, was the attention of great numbers of people that Occupy had, because religion, for a lot of these people, still is the very last place they want to be, which is another reason that people of color were not interested in that, because even when we question um, the faith communities from which we come, we still have a deep respect for what faith communities accomplish, uh, no matter what that community is. We didn't get broad respect until we showed up with the African American community. That's what pivoted it, right? Like they were willing to kind of have us there, but when we showed up, we sh one of the uh, pieces we organized was the anniversary march of a black power march in the 70s that fell in that time period like in October some sometime in there I can't remember the exact date and we marched 10,000 people over the Brooklyn Bridge and ended up in Zuccotti Park and this was not their event not the occupiers event this was the black churches event and uh, then all of a sudden you know these people some of them want to see this as a broader movement and, and you, know, you can uh, insult the white church, but it was much harder for them to insult the black church at that moment, which has its own problems and critiques. And um, So that started to change things. But, but the other thing it did was reveal a lot of the tensions around race lines. So independent of religious uh, tensions with people of faith, um, the faith community showing up writ large was coming up as a very diverse presence with very different cultural marks in their mind for what the struggle is and where it started and how it manifests. What's interesting to me is sometimes the religious tension actually was covering some racial tension. Uh, there was a prominent, very committed to liberation theology church in East Oakland, a prominent black church that had heard about Occupy and created some space for some of the young activists, many of whom were white, to come into the space. Some of those young activists were activated by being in a religious space and behaved in ways that the church leaders found super disrespectful, right? Using curse words, saying derogatory things about the divine. Um, and I remember the, the pastor saying, if you can't behave in church, you don't get to use our space. All we're asking for is to be respected. Whereas the young people were like, right, but the church has collaborated with blah, 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 you know, all the language. And so there was a tension of people who had only had negative experiences of church, not seeing this one invitation as changing the narrative in contrast with folks who said, you know what, all of white America has always been against us and we're creating this space for you because we see this alignment and you can't even respect us in our own space, one of the very few spaces we have. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. They had the great paper mache golden calf, which was so such a good visual image. I was there when they brought the golden calf. So the golden calf was a part of the processional. It was like a miniature of the Wall Street bull, but it was it was designed to be the golden calf. And they marched around the encampment with this thing, and people loved it. I mean, it just it was such a powerful symbol. James Salt from Catholics United <laughs> actually had this idea of a golden calf shaped like a Wall Street bull. And that was very exciting to me. Uh, this fits the way we were brainstorming, which is, you know, through archetype, which is have an image that tells a whole story to your heart and picks up on that cultural narrative. So this guy shows up and um, we put out the call and people showed up and we marched through the streets of lower Manhattan um, with this golden calf uh, over your head, which is a great experience. 
uh, to have going past brunch people. Um, but then uh, that turned into um, kind of a regular gathering, faith gathering at Zuccotti Park. It's wrong for them. It's wrong for them. To build out corporations. To build out corporations. They do not build out the poor. They do not build out the poor. They're so concerned. So concerned. For the poor. For the poor. For the elderly. For the elderly. For the youth. For the youth. And for all Americans who need work. And for all Already, when it was broken up, it was becoming an unsustainable place. And I think it was incredibly powerful to have that kind of gathering as part of the organizing and really kept me aware at all times of what we were doing and just how bad the consequences of our systems were and how much work it would take, not just at a structural level, but just how much like people work it was going to take and how hard building any sort of community that serves us all is going to be when we've been so badly harmed by the existing structures that we have. I think a lot of us were noticing that under the guise of ideological uh, conflict between such communities, not just the African-American church, which is not one community, but just to speak broadly for a second, um, a lot of behavior that is just at best microaggression, um, but just flat out racist with zero education or knowledge outside of their issue of how economics touches race in America in any way. I can think of a billion little conversations that reflect what I think became a general mode that this was, um, that you can't make a movement like this led by these people, right? And that if, unless race is at the center of an argument around economics and colonialism in America, um, that wasn't going to do, that wasn't going to happen, right? So Occupy was trying to be intersectional, but it, um, but it, it, I think on the ground didn't quite have uh, the experience, right? It, it still was being held by a few white guys was the perception. Um, I think a lot of people, as they deepened their understanding of the nature of the problem, started to recognize that maybe our frame here is all wrong going to Wall Street, using language of occupation, right? Evo evoking colonization. Maybe that, maybe everything about this is kind of backwards. And in some ways, you know, when, when Black Lives Matter swelled up a couple of years ago, a lot of these people had, a, had now, you know, a, 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 an analysis and a, a place to work from um, to, to, to be allies that, you know, that, that Occupy couldn't have been. <laughs> My experience of protest in general is that there is something very spiritual around uniting people in a cause to push to make the world more just in some way. And Occupy was the largest and longest lasting expression of that I've ever found. So there were a lot of like transcendent moments, especially around the marching, 
And then the day-to-day -day realities of trying to organize together were very rough and, and trying. There's one class I teach on social justice and theology. The class that I was teaching this past semester when they said, yeah, Occupy was just a flash in the pan. The Seattle protests were just a flash in the pan. The Zapatista movement didn't have any long lasting impact. Those resistance efforts to um, anti-poor people legislation of the 1990s didn't have any carryover. I asked the students, how many of you have been involved in the Wall Street, uh, sorry, the Walmart workers campaign? And most of them had been in some fashion. How many of you have been engaged in the fast food workers campaign of the past five years? And some of them had been. How many of you have been involved in the poor people's campaign? And most of them, almost all of them were. And I said, do you ever wonder what landscape led to those, to those current day campaigns being possible? And it hadn't crossed their mind. So they didn't see any connections. They hadn't been able to connect the dots. But for me, um, while I have my sadnesses and uh, heartbreaks over the ways that white privilege and, um, and a lot of other things played themselves out in those spaces, I do not think we'd be having the conversations we're having now about increasing the minimum wage around access to health care, around people's active responses to how horrific uh, the COVID response has been. I don't think any of those things would be possible without the ground that was laid uh, in, in those days. The gathered community is always a spiritual experience for me. So when I saw all of us in our collars or in our hijabs or um, kneeling and praying that people would begin to see and to understand and that they would feel a sense of urgency. That was spiritual for me. And I remember one meeting we had at Judson with all of the different faith leaders and we were sitting in the circle and we were still working out what our relationship was going to be with Occupy itself. But I think it was Donna who decided that we all ought to read out loud the complete texts of Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Now I've read it any number of times, but there was something about hearing it out loud and hearing it in a community a multiracial, multi-faith community of people committed to making a change and hearing in people's voices that they were being convicted by some of Dr. King's words. Because everybody loves Dr. King on the 15th of January, but nobody ever quotes from his really incisive things about what people have to do, why moderates are a clear and present danger, things about the economic inequalities and injustices that black people face. That's the part they never want to quote, ever. But to hear this group of faith leaders reading it and taking it in in a new way in light of this upheaval in understanding the economy and the injustice of it all. There's no conversation that we're having right now about economic inequality that could have taken place without Occupy. And I think people forget that. It's not that they, um, it's not that the inequalities weren't real, but they were invisible in some crucial ways. And Zuccotti and the other things around it and the language of the 99% and the 1%. Bernie didn't have that language. He got that from Occupy. All those things are the fruits of what at the time looked like a fruitless exercise. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's all a spiritual experience. If you're up if you're downtown at 3 a.m. in a bar planning to use stilt to get over a gate to break into another church, then yeah, that's a spiritual experience, and it's one you're never going to forget. And but but uh, uh, less of an ecstatic, roomy um, religious experience, and one that comes out of friendship and discovery.
I mean, some of the best friends I have in my life, I found in Occupy. And finding uh, people both in and out of the faith community who felt like they had a deeper analysis on what needs to happen to our civilization, um, that was magic. And it was like a lot of people got to find each other. And so um, in the sense that, you know, you need catastrophe to sort of re-scramble the neurons and have them reconnect, uh, I found a whole universe of people who I felt like were having a much more sophisticated analysis on where we are as a people and as a culture. And what is it going to take to knock that? And uh, to me, that was magic and it was liberating uh, to not feel like I was alone on a few things. And, um, and I think that to this day, I still work with people all around the country who I met in that time. It felt honestly like a glimpse of the second chapter of Acts when people held all things in common, you know, which is to say it felt like a glimpse of the kingdom of God or the beloved community in action. Um, so I think it, it raised the bar for me and my what I expect from a community of people who say they're, they have a spiritual life. You know, I... I come up in this kind of Catholic radical tradition of in which the street is a holy place in which in which uh, uh, you know being uh, you know embracing poverty for the sake of justice is you know a very old old game and um, so the things that they were doing the things that they were talking about, the idea of, of living your your values in the most radical way that you can in a, a, a space of shared community, you know, is to me incredibly core to to what the you know what the Christian movement is is all about. And so I actually felt in some ways more at home than I had in many religious spaces. And this is a mystery I still am sorting out. But you know, I had I, I'm a convert. I became uh, Catholic when I was a teenager. And for years and years after, I really didn't feel comfortable identifying myself as a Christian. I was so uncertain about that identification, about that identity. You know, being in kind of being present to and documenting and, and even participating in, in this protest movement, that actually that went away. I remember having this feeling of being in the subway, you know, coming you know, I was, I was going somewhere off the square and coming back one day and just feeling like I am not in the real world until I get back there. Right. And I, I can't but help but imagine that that, you know, the first Christians felt that way. In terms of thinking about what I what I learned from Occupy is that um, is that movements also have seasons. You know, there's always that initial surge of, of energy and productivity and hope that happens right at the beginning. And then there's usually an ebb. Um, and I find that sometimes people who are, are newer to justice work get very frustrated by that. I think one thing that I learned from Occupy in some ways is that the measure of a movement's success is not in how many people continue to protest. That, that the measure of a movement's success is how many people become radicalized and mobilized um, in a variety of ways. And and how many people continue to do that slower and often, you know, less exciting, but I think maybe more crucial work um, of organizing for justice. And I think Occupy is a great example of that. Again, um, I've watched this movie a couple of times and I'm always like still so moved by the way that Occupy was mediated. So huge thanks to Bill because a lot of the imagery standing alone is just so powerful. Um, but we also have two notable folks who were in the film with us today. I'd love to introduce 
Reverend Rosemary Ray McNatt, um, who became the president of Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley, California on July 1st, 2004. For 13 years, she was senior minister of the Fourth Universalist Society um, here in New York City, a uh, 175-year-old Unitarian Universalist congregation on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, she is a graduate of Yale University and Drew Theological Seminary. Hi. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. I'd, I'd like to also introduce the Reverend Michael Ellick who is currently the Director of Public Engagement for the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, but was a minister at Judson Memorial Church back in 2011, right across the street. In recent years, he co-founded the Common Table of Oregon and Reckoning with Racism, interfaith organizing projects rooted in truth, repair, and reconciliation. Thank you so much um, for being with us. Um, when Nora and I first kind of got together to speak about how we wanted to engage in some dialogue with both of you. Um, we really came to a place of seeing three major points that stood out for both of us as being really um, crucial to how we think about this film, especially now in 2021. So that is how we see Occupy and race, how we see your role as faith leaders in Occupy. And then kind of the third piece is how these movements, including Occupy, how we see sustainability in them moving forward from them. Um, so we're gonna kind of engage in those three topics in our conversation, and then we're gonna invite um, audience question and answer after that. So uh, those uh, in the Zoom, please feel free to hop in the chat and send those along. Um, and all of you that are here, please feel free to have some questions ready when we get there. Um, and so now I'll pass it over to Nora. Yes, thank you. I'd love to start off the conversation um, with something that both Reverend Rosemary and Reverend Michael have brought up in the film, which is the shortcomings within Occupy when it came to race. Um, so I would love for you to speak on how have some of how have these shortcomings taught us to weave racial analysis into the fabric of the movement of Occupy, but also movements there on out. First of all, thank you for having both of us here, giving Michael and I a chance to reconnect because we haven't seen each other in a, in a good little while. So it's wonderful to see Michael. Um, you know, I feel that there are still big segments of the activist community that still don't understand the primacy of race in economic systems in the United States and the way in which race permeates every part of American life. Um, George Floyd's murder and the subsequent protests about that was the most obvious and public way in which activists could make that connection if they chose. But we know that people don't always choose to do that. Um, I left New York in 2014 to become president of one of the two Unitarian Universal Seminaries um, here in uh, California. We've moved to Oakland, Rod Berkeley. But for almost 25 years, this seminary has had an intersectional analysis in the way that we educate students. Um, we think of ourselves as a kind of force multiplier to create uh, religious leaders who have an understanding uh, about oppressions of all kinds and the ways in which we counter them. Um, but it is such difficult work and such demanding work that it's not a surprise that it's difficult for people to sustain without a community of people to sustain them. Occupy Faith was so frustrating to me personally on some levels that there were several times when I was ready to like just going back to my parish. Michael and I had many conversations about how much toxic racism I was willing to expose myself to, even as I was committed to the work. Um, I used to bring my congregants to interfaith services. Like I'd preach and then I'd say, okay, we're, we're leaving at 1230, we're getting on the subway, we're going downtown to Zagati Park. You know, so I had like 25 people, including my husband and the kids who would come with me to these things, but it was really hard to sustain knowing that there was this structure of structuralness 
Um, and even though there's a lot of romance attached to the stack and a lot of romance attached to uh, the way in which people would talk, there was still this group of white guys who ran everything and talked everything to death and um, reminded a whole group of activists who had been doing this before about an article called The Tyranny of Structurelessness that became a, a sort of required reading for those of us who had had enough of what was going on down downtown but still believed in its importance. Michael, I'm interested in, in hearing your reflections after all this time. Oh, you're Michael, muted. you're muted. Thanks, man. Uh, um, well, yeah, there's so much to say on this. I mean, you know, uh, there had been uh, strong faith-based rooted organizing, community organizing long before Occupy. And because uh, that kind of community organizing is rooted in the community experience and local community experiences. If you don't develop uh, an analysis around race, then you're not doing the work. You're not, uh, not because we're so, uh, and I say we, I just mean not, if you're actually an organizer, um, that grows out of the work, that grows out of the relationships. And this wasn't that, right? This, this was magic and it was wonderful. And there was so many wonderful things um, that erupted at the same time as a lot of different things came together, um, but no human planned it. It was not planned. Um, a lot of elements of it were. So when that uh, strange intersection between internet, mass communications, a shared frustration um, following the 2008 bailouts, you know, so many different pieces came. But yeah, I think Rosemary definitely speaks for me. I was a immigration organizer uh, and pastor before that. And so uh, for us, that was um, a lot of those racial questions were the first things we were asking and we were, we were getting put off. Um, it was like, ah, oh, that's a tack on. Environment, that's a tack on. Race, it's a tack on. And, and this is what we're doing. And th there was that feeling to it. Um, and I don't wanna make us sound like oh, prophetic or prescient and then not all of us have a layer of awakening that we're doing to the blindness is inherent of our culture. And like, I look back to what my daughter will think about what I'm doing today. And she might look at our severed relationship with the land. She might look mm. at the way we treat mm. animals and it might one day be reprehensible what we do in our consumerist society. You know what I mean? Like how the F do you get off? like trying to act like you know what's going on when you were going back home and you had a thing from ikea or whatever it was right like it could be that those veils will be lifted and so on one hand yeah there was a depending on where you were coming from in that shared space there were layers of wakefulness around how these things came together um and yeah, there's a lot of people who couldn't do that, right? And a lot of people who could, and we're in a different moment now, but I think that work continues, right? Like we are all, you know, waking up to deeper layers of our vulnerable beauty <laughs> with each other. Um, and so on one hand, what was powerful about Occupy or, um, or movements now, I mean, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter, in a way it's a, it's a, it's a similar organizing uh, push, uh, it's, which is to say it's not community organizing, right? There is not levers of power being analyzed and dismantled. Like that, that's not what's happening, right? It's a mass uh, eruption that's different than, so now that's happening, you, you get organizing like in local areas, but what's erupting naturally is, is very similar to Occupy. Mm. Um, so anyway, we can go on and on and on with this, but it's, um, I think one of the things that's powerful about these sort of chaotic movements is that you do allow for uh, inner, um, interdependence to occur. You, you learn things from each other fast. And if it was always uh, one structure, you might not have that cross pollination happening. Mm. So yeah, totally toxic. There's a horrible things going on. It was embarrassing to me and to others at times. Like you, you both want to brag about your involvement with Occupy and then have no one know that you were involved with <laughs> Occupy uh, simultaneously, depending on who you're talking to in this setting, you know, uh, but that continues to our work today. Sorry. I also want to add that once Zuccotti Park broke up, there were still those of us who were working. We were still trying to figure out how to carry what we were learning forward. 
And so we're still meeting at Judson. And then we start meeting at my church because there's space and there's time and I can do that. But the group's getting smaller and smaller because it's so hard to sustain and so hard to get traction mm. around making inroads into, into situations, into difficulties. I remember that we were desperately trying to interrupt the New York state budget process mm. and the ways in which Governor Cuomo was cutting stuff out cutting the education budget, trying to use this organizing that we had done in Occupy Faith and trying to move it over into these other spheres. Um, it didn't always work. We weren't successful. We got arrested, but it didn't, it didn't really mm. move the needle. At the same time, we were also working on, that was the beginning for me and my interest in the Fight for 15, because mm -hmm. by then the Fight for 15 had emerged. Mm -hmm. So there are all these different movements that emerged in the wake of Zuccotti Park and what happened. And so similarly, I, I want to take, I want to challenge you, Michael, about Black Lives Matter and how it was organic. The start of it was organic. But it was able to capitalize on the existing organizations and structures of people who were already working in their communities, but couldn't get traction. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Black Lives Matter had provided a way for people to get traction around things that they have been working on in their own communities for decades. Yeah, It's kind of like Claudette Colvin and, and Rosa Parks. You know, they didn't just sit down because their feet hurt. Mm -hmm. There had been all this organizing in the back end, but there was nowhere to put it. So I, I feel like Occupy Faith had similar issues. We, mm. we still kept doing things, even when it didn't feel like it was worthwhile. Mm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I think like that was something that you know, when Nora and I spoke after watching this, that was the biggest takeaway for us was the like seeing it through the eyes of folks who had, you know, really dedicated a lot of themselves to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, post, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, like that was such a big just juxtaposition for us to deal with. But I think that that like level of intersectionality also like is something that we're still seeing today with you know how the queer community gets lumped into black lives matter or how other so i i really appreciate that but what i really i really what i want to get into in some ways is where how how your faith drove you to engage with a other faith community members but also with you know this kind of really interesting movement at the time i mean i'll I'll just say I was talking with um, our Episcopal spiritual life advisor here today, and we were talking about a part of Occupy that I'd completely forgotten, which was the way in which Trinity Wall Street was not really Ooh. open or accessible um, to the movement. Um, and we talked about how within our own community, there was a lot of strife um, and there was a lot of a lot of Episcopalians were pretty upset over that, as I know lots of other Epis uh, people of faith were. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is that like personal side for you of where is your faith driving you here in this, but then also like how, how did the organizing come together, especially when, you know, obviously in any movement, not all faith communities are coming behind the same agenda here. And so I'm just kind of interested in that personal side, but also from your institutional perspective, where that comes from. You should start, Michael. Let's start with you. <laughs> Your as, turn. Someone, as someone who is banned from Trinity Wall Street, I will. Uh, I'll <laughs> yes, start. you are. Yes, um, you are. Which is tough because I actually yeah. I never pulled I never pulled anything on Trinity. Uh, no, I was associated with it. You did uh, because of my friendship with um, uh, George Packard. Basically, that bans me for life. Yep. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's so much th that's of interest to here. I mean, Rosemary and I and others involved, we're, I, I primarily see myself as a religious person. Like That's my dominant identity uh -huh. in the world. Uh -huh. I was a monk. I was a minister. I, you know, th this is where, and so the prophetic call of our tradition to, I feel like I'm in pretty safe ground on that front. You know, I feel like this uh -huh. um, grows out pretty organically. 
But of course, throughout history, you see a tension between empire and the resistance to empire. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's an external threat and sometimes that's an internal threat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to remind us where we were before Occupy, you, you, you didn't take a shot against capitalism in a Sunday morning church service and not get pushback from your crowd. I, I preached in a pretty radical place um, and cap you didn't do that. Now that's fairly commonplace, like capitalism, F capitalism, you know? Um, so what you started to see though was a non-hierarchical dismantling ethic, that there was a dissembling going on. And I love that Rosemary mentions how um, toxic this attempt at leaderlessness can be because mm. under that ethic of virtue, uh, a lot of damage, uh, it become, you know, like anything else, it can get hidden. But to put a positive light on it for a moment, you see an ethic of trying to not trust the hierarchies of our institutions mm -hmm. and to hold them accountable to the same ethics that we would hold our institutions accountable. If you do that, what you discover is that we're pretty toxic as well, and mm -hmm. and so I think there was a there was a there was a calling out, there was a calling in that was going on, um, and I mean th this is a subject for a different documentary. I mean, like, you know, I don't know if this is true for you, Rosemary, but for a couple years there, uh, every institution I know is making money off of um, uh, the work that that I and others did, and. Um, and, and I, I would never get a job at one of them, right? Like in a weird, certain way, we were a little bit toxic to the system, right? And it's like all well and good for you to go out as long as you come home and don't ask us to be accountable to the same piece. So here we are inside a medieval worldview that is dead. And that is, I mean, I, I defy anyone to tell me that the church is a, you know, and I, I say this as a religious person, <laughs> is yeah. not a derelict worldview, right? Like, I don't mean that as a critique, I mean that as a flat fact. And so um, so if you're still here, and if, like, as I said in the video, uh, there's this deeper analysis going on. Now, the way that ends up playing out in Wall Street, it was not just a theory, like, oh, some pastors are down there, sometimes are, are not. Um, but it played out against real estate, right? Like the, the story of uh, Trinity and what they did or didn't do or whatever else, you know what I mean? Like that's its own like um, melodrama. That's a whole so, other story. Yeah, it's a whole other story. I mean, it's a good one. And it, but it, but it, I think that that was playing out church by church by church by church. Yeah. And so you bring in Wall Streeters, uh, Occupy Wall Street folk into the basement of your church. They do not respect the community agreements that the church and some of those community agreements are toxic and are hierarchical and we're privileged and some of them were not some of them were right. sacred and they mm. were about trust mm. and accountability across lines and right. so um so there's so much nuance here i hate to give broad generalities because there's a lot of subtlety in what was playing out there and some of it mm. was wonderful and needed and some mm. of it was just uh reflective of people all trapped under the empire and raised by it so I, I, rosemary you you saw this in your own church too i know oh boy did i um so on a personal level uh, i i can't claim that being a unitarian universalist was the catalyst for my doing things because i have always been an activist it I think I went to my first march with my parents when I was 10. Mm. And I have always done that around the women's movement, around uh, issues of race, all this other stuff. In fact, that when we went to the governor's office that time and I got arrested, someone took a picture of me with the zip ties, you know, and my, you know, my stolen stuff being led into the wagon and posted it on Facebook. And my niece saw it and showed it to my late mother who looked at it and said, is she still doing this? <laughs> Which was not the response you would usually get, but that was the kind of kid I was. That was the kind of young adult I was. Part of that happened, had to do with um, being a child, literally a child of the civil rights movement, mm. right? All this stuff was going on when I was a kid. Part of it was being a child um, growing up in a Roman Catholic Chicago which in the 60s was a radical place to be. Nuns and priests were getting arrested in the civil rights movement. 
I remember Sister Amanda, my fourth grade teacher, who was just a nightmare in every other sense, had seen a front page. She really was. She, um, she'd seen some headline in the paper that was being um, contemptuous of black civil rights marchers. And she was waving the paper in the classroom, having a fit, saying, don't believe any of this. You are children of God. I've mm. never forgotten. Mm. And so there has always been this sense for me that I'm a child of God. I, I need to be making sure that other children of God have a space and are recognized in the world. That's part of my responsibility as a human being. And so having that is what drew me to Unitarian Universalism. Mm. Um, because my husband grew up as a birthright African-American Unitarian Universalist. And anybody who knows anything about Unitarian Universalists knows how rare that is. Because it's a predominantly white denomination. But the sense of responsibility about activism and the desire and need to move in a way that makes life more abundant for more people is very much part of that tradition. It's what called me to the church in the first place and what called me into ministry from a perfectly respectable career as a journalist, because that's what I used to do. <laughs> um, so there was nothing out of keeping with my being in these marches, in these protests. I do remember, and, and, and ordinarily, Unitarian Universalists pride themselves on being willing to challenge the status quo until I preached about Occupy and about mm. capitalism and a multi-generational service that included a gigantic monopoly board that the kids were using for the story of all ages, which is the part that's meant for kids, but is really applicable to all ages. And a member of my congregation, who was a banker, literally started talking back to me while I was preaching. Mm. Because it was fine if I wanted to talk about race, if it was fine if I wanted to talk about other things. But as soon as I started talking about capitalism, he felt accused. Mm -hmm. And to some degree he was, yeah. you know, but I was not calling him names or doing any of that stuff. I talked about the ways in which we are trapped by this system. Everybody, even the people who participate in it, right? And that was too much, mm. that was too much. So I think that all of us who had pastoral responsibilities had to balance that, had to negotiate that because sometimes this argument gets too close. Mm. You think about Rosemary, the uh, Martin Luther King's speech at Riverside Church, his sermon. That's right. And, and obviously this is famous analysis now, right? Everyone knows this, uh, but here we were coming from the reverse side, right? Like we were starting with uh, finance and then moving into race. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's an interesting, you know, we, Something like Trinity, uh, how is the church responsible to these values, right? Like, what does it mean? That, that's an internal conversation that's being played out writ large right now around race, around finances. Like, church is still, what, they, what's the old expression? It's like the least diverse place in America is Sunday morning. Yeah. And, that's yeah. right. And, um, but it's just interesting, you know, the, the vestry for Trinity Wall Street is the, is, as it was, I don't know how it is anymore, but it was a privately held group. It's not, it, it did not play with the rules of typical Episcopal vestries. And then when you find it and leak it to the press, you learn that it's actually a real estate board filled with yeah. the police commissioners oh, wow. and it's filled yeah. with, and people who did not attend that church. But as the third largest landowner of Manhattan, like who do we, level these critiques at? Do we level them at um, people walking by who are, got a job at a banking firm or to those landowners who are us, right? So that friction between institutional reality, and again, Rosemary and I are from, from kind of free churchy traditions where right. the hierarchy- And that does make a difference. It, it totally, like I had an excuse to, you know, I did not, I was not beholden to the same things that my Episcopal and Catholic friends were, right. but I got to say the Episcopals, um, the ones who are directly beholden and could have lost their careers forever 
like no one they're just not going to hire me they're not going to ruin my career you know but uh, let's say michael snippen john mertz george packard like these are guys who the bishop you know i'm not saying anything that isn't public knowledge it went after them right yeah. was they were never going to work in manhattan ever again that's right you know, yeah so where do we where do we challenge and where does religious obedience uh get you know to a structure we're all trained in this beautiful image of like, oh, I've got a Monsignor or someone who trains me. And um, where does that give way to this prophetic analysis? And mm -hmm. that, that's being played out right now. And it has been for 2000 years. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the role of gender in, in this. I have, I come out of a free church, church tradition as a Unitarian Universalist. We're probably the only, um, religious community where a majority of the clergy are now women, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's now it's like 56%. But, you know, sexism played a role in many of these same arguments and conversations, because there was no intersectional analysis going on in Occupy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was still a very much an academic space. They, they, they weren't in that, right? And part of the reason that I'm a Unitarian Universalist and willing and able to do this work is because the Catholicism of my childhood made no space for me to do that as a leader, right? Amen. Because women can't lead. Women, until recently, couldn't even serve mass. I remember asking Father Walsh to let me serve mass with my brother because my brother was an altar boy and I was a devout child. And he looked at me and he wasn't even mad. He just looked at me like, what is wrong with this child? And said, you can't serve mass, you're a girl. Yeah. And truthfully, I've been mad ever since. <laughs> yeah. I'm still mad and I'm an old woman, okay? <laughs> no, I, I, I really appreciate this. And I, I'm sorry to say we're running a bit out of oh, time. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, no, 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 this is like, for me at least, this is speaking to my soul. I'm an Episcopal so vestry member. Like this is speaking to a lot of the stuff I'm thinking about in my own institution. Um, but we want to give an opportunity, A, for if there's any quick questions from the audience here from online, and then also to give you an opportunity to have any final closing thoughts. Um, and also plug in your organizations. You both serve on in like really incredible boards, um, members of really incredible communities. So we have a cohort of students to the left of us, as you know. Um, we also have attendees from non-NYU organizations. So we would love to hear um, even organizing efforts that you would recommend folks tuning in to be involved in. I'm looking at someone who, someone has a comment. Yes, yeah, just, just about gender balance in terms of the yes. church, I think like, that was thank you for speaking that into existence because it's something that all faith traditions are still dealing with and Definitely. i think especially yeah. around non-binary and gender non-conforming people um yes. so i'll put in a plug for my school uh mm -hmm. striking school for the ministry where we have people who are have a variety of gender expressions some are trans some are non-binary some are gender non-conforming some are bi they're queer in some way. I would guess about a third of our of our student body um, is gender nonconforming or L part of the LGBTQIA uh -huh. plus community yeah. Um, yeah. because that is a part of our inclusive community standard. Um, we believe in the beloved community and what it represents. And so, even though about a I, I would say maybe 60% of our students are Unitarian Universalists and are training for Unitarian Universalist ministry. The other 40% are a variety of faith traditions. We have Buddhists, we have Hindus, we have pagans. Um, we have people who are not quite sure and who are exploring, who are using seminary as a process of discernment. Um, we have what we think was the first master of arts and social change in the world where you can get a degree in learning how to make sacred social change. Um, so we have people who are involved in the um, movement for climate justice and in a host of other movements. Um, so if there are people who are listening, who are thinking about seminary um, or thinking about taking some courses in, in a way that would allow them to discern whether that was 
the right place for them, I would encourage them to look at our website, which I will type in the chat. Please do, Thank yeah. You. And before we, I, I want to also hear your uh, last words, Reverend Michael, but we do have one student question that we want to share with you, so. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Farzana. It was great watching the film and great to meet you all. Uh, my question is, with all this reflection and understanding the things from Occupy that um, you can improve on, how would you structure another Mozart faith movement? Mm. Could you say the last part again? How about we structure a multi-faith Another multi-faith uh, movement. Mm. That's a um, that's a tough question. I, you know, I think churches are uh, in, a, in a state of radical transformation right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if churches should be leading movements, frankly. Um, I work for an ecumenical organization that works with a lot of different denominations, interfaith, uh, um, and one of the projects I've done in recent years um, is, is explicitly around the intersections of race, environment, economics, finance. And, and part of it is this idea that there's something disingenuous about us as faith people with these institutions going out and, and saying, raising our fists against racism when we, uh, the way we got here as colonizers, the way we continue to be here as people who live on this planet in a certain way needs some unpacking. And so a lot of what I do now is help um, in relationship with a couple of different denominations. And uh, like right now we have to think like 50 different churches in it. And then Claremont's part of it. Claremont Seminary moved up to Oregon recently. That's right. Um, we're, we're relying on a lot of their professorial strength is, is doing these truth repair and reconciliation models is to say that before we can really understand what our role as people of faith is, we've got to unpack what our role has always been. And, and like we uh, maybe uh, didn't come here, didn't colonize, didn't have uh, slaves, but we we have the wealth and the privilege still that comes with that. We still inherit those structures. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a crucial um, reworking to be done inside the faith community. And I've been encouraged to see a lot of seminaries uh, pick up our work and sort of reimagine what it's like to help local faith communities discern not just what do they want to go out there and shout at, but how do they take uh, responsibility for what I believe is a worldview shift. Like we're at a point where we're re-examining what our basic relations be between ourselves, each other, the land, um, what those need to look like. And um, what does it mean to be, uh, uh, to dismantle capitalism? Uh, you know, what does that actually look like? And you can't do that without race. You can't do that without thinking about our relationship to the land. So I think there's a, there's a kind of a reckoning and that's what we call it, of course, here. I don't mean the brand, but uh, um, but but that's work that be integral for me um, and something that we grew out of uh, out of Occupy. It felt too easy to go out and, and shout at the heavens and not do our work uh, back at home. And also as people of faith, you know, we're trained to, um, be famous, right? We're trained to get up and promote our personal brands and not trained always to do the work. And I think there's a real distinction between the menu, the, the heading of something, which can seem very glamorous, and then the actual rolling up your sleeves and being beholden to that analysis in local community. So for me, that shift meant like moving back to where I'm from, right? And, did, and like, where is the land that my ancestors have a debt of responsibility to? And what does it mean to do that with the indigenous members of the community that we directly harmed and, and to rebuild community up from the earth up? So that's a long-winded way of saying, like, I, I think that our traditional movement vectors have, be, have been rewritten a, a little bit by Occupy, but especially by Black Lives Matter. And I think we're seeing a real seismic shift, especially for the church, as it moves out of leadership and into... Uh, a deeper process of reckoning. But I'm not a professor, and, and Rosemary will have a better answer. Well, I don't know that I'll have a better answer, but I'll have a different one <laughs> um, based on what we see as our role. Um, as I said earlier, we think of ourselves as force multipliers. Our responsibility is to help to create leaders who can go into communities, whether it's the communities they come from or other communities, and begin that unpacking process, remembering that all of us have some measure of marginalization, 
in their lives and some measure of privilege in their lives. And, it, and that there's nuance attached to all of it and that the building of a multi-faith community requires an understanding of that nuance and a, and a generosity of spirit as we explore what it means to be together with these different faith practices without trying to uh, appropriate them. We spend a lot of time on the difference between a cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation, how you don't just start grabbing people's uh, sacred objects and using them as though they were yours without owning where it is that they come from. And so there's layer after layer of, of unpacking all of these things in a way that we hope creates leaders prepared to work with a variety of communities of faith and people who don't have any faith at all because not everybody we're going to be working with in life is connected or attached to a religious community. They've been harmed by religious community. And there's some responsibility that we have to acknowledge in, in speaking with them and helping them understand that perhaps the communities we're creating are safe for them to be part of. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, sadly, we have to wrap up. I feel like oh, good. this might buy fast. I know, yeah, right? <laughs> time goes too quickly. This really, we could go on forever. I, we really appreciate your wisdom and your time. And um, thank you, Bill, also. Thank Thanks, you so Bill, much. for getting us all yeah. together. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Chelsea, Nick, Nor, Robert, Taylor, Jr., over, everybody over there. Thank you. So Robert Michael, is actually going to come. Rosemary. Ro Ro Robert is going to come on actually right now and share oh, with great. us a few events that are happening um, around campus for us. Um, but when the pandemic finally comes to a place where we can travel again, and if you come and visit us here in New York, please stop by because we um, were, we would love to have you. And we really have a great group of students here who love- it was such an honor. I would love that. I love NYU. My husband went to Tisch in his <laughs> wanting to be a, a actor moment. And I miss New York City, so you may yet get that visit from me. I know. Oh, I miss New York for sure. I'm please, sure. yeah. My wife and I are coming out in the spring, so we'll. I'll let you know. I'll let you please know. do. We please do. All the time. Please we do. About New York. Okay. All right. Now I'm. I'm. I'm bringing Robert onto the stage. Hi, Robert. We didn't get a chance to thank you. Thank you for having us. I didn't do too many things. It was the amazing <laughs> people here really driving. Uh, I work forward, but I want to thank everyone who's joining us both in the room and online and to offer you two events to join us at one of them being uh, the opening marquee event for Trans Awareness Week that starts next week, Monday. Mm -hmm. GSL in partnership with the LGBTQ plus student center is going to be hosting a conversation with uh, black trans activists, writer and social media strategist. Uh, Raquel Willis in conversation with another student led uh, by myself. Mm -hmm. And it's also International Education Week. And so we'll be hosting a Cultivating Beloved Community, which you referenced earlier, a session focusing in on values based living in a global world. And that's going to be on Wednesday, November 17th at 7 a.m. Both of these things, which can be found on the Global Spiritual Life link tree. I mean, that's at NYU Global Spiritual Life. Uh, you can follow us there. Okay. And with that, thank you all. Our thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thanks, Rosemary. For doing so thank you. Well. Be well. Have, have a good night. You, Rosemary. Yes, right. please. Take yeah, care. Okay. All right. Thank Take you. Take care, friends. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.